what the Bible says about death, afterlife, and the future. Back in 1985 or 6, I was teaching at William and Mary, and I got a call. I still remember. You know how some things will stick in your mind. I'm in the kitchen making coffee or something, and the wall, one of those wall phones on the kitchen rings, and I was just completely shocked. It's Morton Smith. The great Morton Smith is calling me in my kitchen. And I'm just a lowly assistant professor, not even, didn't even have tenure. And uh, he said, James, or I think he called me Jim, I'm doing a volume with Joe Hoffman. Harper, this is big time. I'm a beginning professor. Uh, what the Bible really says, and it's going to have all these topics like divorce and, you know, afterlife and sexuality and marriage and just what the Bible really says. And the idea would be the really. Like what does it really say? Not what you heard it said or what you assumed it said, but if you actually looked at it. And he said, I want to assign you, look at this title. He tells me this. Death, Afterlife, and the Future. <laughs> I mean, don't you think that's a little much? It's one chapter. I think it'd be three chapters. And he gave me the word length. I don't remember what it was, but you can see the size of the article. What is it, 10 pages or something? So you figure it out, a few thousand words. And he said, just uh, be, be very, very succinct and very to the point. I'm telling you, I worked harder on this article, I think, than anything I've ever written. First of all, I was just in such awe of Professor Smith. Uh, he was an amazing person, just awesome in his knowledge and scholarship and also a very kind man. He did not use a computer. He used a telephone, unlike my other advisor, Jonathan Smith at Chicago, who doesn't even use a telephone. But these are people of the old school. You get handwritten notes on their little piece of stationery at their desk. And these are of the generation that spend the morning answering correspondence, even from a student. I sent him drafts of my dissertation early on. And I get these lovely, I still have them, they're like precious to me, little handwritten notes from Morton Smith, taking the time to read my work and help a student. Uh, this is just something that we don't have anymore with cell phones and email and internet and we're so busy and, uh, and I'm all part of that. I'm not complaining about it because I'm right in the middle of it. So anyway, that's how this article came about. I think it's, uh, I'm very proud of it and I'm glad I was forced to do it because I think it puts in a few pages uh, so a very, very important topic. Uh, and this is Old New Testament and Apocrypha. I mean, when we say the Bible, we mean everything. So it was tough, folks. Now, today, though, I'm not doing the future. I'm mainly wanting to concentrate on death and afterlife. And here is a very typical view of the cosmos. You can get this sort of thing in lots of places. Essentially, the ancient Near East, or the world of the Hebrew Bible, is a triple-deck world. You've got the heaven. All the stars, moon, and planets are under the firmament of heaven. It's like a dome. It's thought to have water, uh, so it's sort of some sort of placenta almost. You know, it's sealed up there. The earth is below. There's chaotic waters on each side, so thank God the dry land is here. Remember Genesis? The water gets moved over, the waters of chaos. And there's a fear in antiquity that that water of chaos could come back. But thankfully, in Genesis, God says, I'll never again send the flood. But if you imagine these waters crashing in, and these waters crashing in, and these waters crashing down, we're, we're like hopeless little ants floating on a bottle cap in a, a vast stormy ocean. But God gives us this space to live our lives. Well, you live your life, but what happens when you die? The, the key quote is early in Genesis, dust you are, we just talked about this, Genesis 3, dust you are and to dust you shall return. The nephesh, Adam became a living soul, is the same nephesh, or it really means life breath, or living breather, I translated in my translation, because that's the most literal translation. A living breather can be a dog, a cat, a frog, a human, and living breathers are mortal, 
and their breath goes forth that God gave, and they return to the dust, and their thoughts perish. So this is the idea. Metaphorically, they come to be understood in an underworld that is called Sheol by the Hebrews, S-H-E-O-L, and Hades by the Greeks. Both words indicate that we don't know what it is. Sha'a, uh, Sheol might even be connected to the word, what is it? Like Sha'a, to ask a question, not sure about that. But Hades is definitely connected to Ades, which means unseen. So it, it reflects the very naming of the, you know, you go down into Sheol, meaning you go down into a kind of oblivion. We don't know much about it. The only case of somebody really coming back, not talking about resuscitation of a corpse, that's different. That's kind of like near death or, you know, that a corpse before it completely decays could be brought back. But the only case of somebody really coming back out of the underworld in the Hebrew Bible would be Samuel, where he comes up and you picture him kind of rubbing his eyes and going, uh, yeah, uh, what do you want and why did you bother me? We get lots of texts about uh, how the dead uh, rest from their labors. They sleep in Sheol. These texts are paralleled in other ancient Near Eastern texts. So there, it's not just in the Bible. If you go to other texts of the ancient Near East, particularly of Babylon, you get the same kind of thing. There are the pillars of the earth, the underworld, the earth, and the heavens. Now, people stay where they belong. Humans never go up here. Think about that. Ascent to heaven. I have an article on my website. So you don't have to buy the Anchor Bible. You can just steal it right here. Uh, and here's a nice text. The heavens are the Lord's, Yahweh's, but the earth he's given to the sons of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any that go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So the notion of the ancient cosmology is that things stay in place, and Genesis is really an account not of creation, uh, like something from nothing, that's a Greek idea. Gen Genesis is, is a story, Genesis 1, of the ordering of heavens and earth. When God began, is how to translate it, when God began to bara, to create, to create order out of chaos, the heavens the earth, let me tell you what it was like. It was waste, it was void. Look at the moon. You follow? So it's like I'm telling you a story. Guess what? When God started, you can't believe the state of things. It was just chaotic. And a deep water covered everything. But then God said, let's get some light on this darkness, right? So you picture a moonscape covered with water and nothing could live. It's just chaos. Let there be light. Let the dry land appear. You see what you're doing? You're ordering the cosmos. You're beginning to bring out a place for human beings where they can live. And then the different uh, creatures that are created. So this is the human place. And so how does Genesis end? God saw that it was good, 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 good. Very good, right? So everything is good. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Sex is good. Everything's good. You're on the earth. But if you leave Eden, you die, and when you die, you go to the dust, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. You don't go up to heaven. So who's in heaven? Well, basically in the Hebrew Bible, gods and uh, various other angelic kinds of beings. Angel is really more of an English word. They're really the malachim, the messengers of God. But they do seem to be uh, other than physical. But you see this sense of the heavens are the Lord's, the earth he's given to the sons of men, and the underworld belongs to the dead. So, if you start asking, could I ever go here, or could I ever go, could someone down here come up here, which would be a sin to heaven or a resurrection of the dead, it doesn't come up. Think of this, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, nobody asks. Nobody asks. In fact, Moses says, this Torah that I'm giving you is not in heaven and is not, look what he does, he does the cosmic door. It's not up here and it's not beyond, out in the ocean, and it's not down in the underworld. 
It is right here in your hand and in your heart that you may do it. As God gave you what you need, you don't need to go up to heaven, you don't need to go over here. Now the one exception is Enoch. And if you remember in Gilgamesh, there is also the legend, it's like Enoch in the sense that Noah, this is just in Gilgamesh, a Noah character, let's say, does live way over here in the Isles of the Blessed. We'll put them way over here. You could never get there, don't even try. But it's not heaven. Basically, you just like sit around and eat mango fruit and I guess look at native populations without clothes. I don't know. It, it, it sounds like a tropical island, but you don't die. And the reason you don't die is you eat this special fruit. So it's just imagining Eden, but it's kind of boring because it's Eden. Eden is boring. You name animals, pet things, and eat. <laughs> but you don't have sex and you don't really do anything and there's not like news breaking. You know, it's, I mean, human history is messy and horrible and awful, but also fascinating. We all know that, right? I mean, it's so awful that you don't even want to know it. But on the other hand, it's reality. And uh, so even though if you're in the Isles of the Blessed, the Greeks have the same legend, the Babylonians, the Hebrews, all kind of have this legend. Well, there could be this place where certain select people are, but, uh, you know, we just have legends about it. But it's not where you're going to go. You're going to go to Sheol. So what about Enoch? Well, you know, don't assume that first Enoch, which comes from the first century B.C., second century B.C., is what Genesis 5 means. And Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. You say, oh, he went to heaven. Don't be so sure. I mean, it's possible. But if he did, okay, he's in heaven. He's an exception. But you're not going there. It's not going to be you. It ain't you, babe. Okay? So, back to the other article, not the Ascent to Heaven article here. And Job is sort of more toward the end of that period. Um, if you remember, Job's, Job's reflecting the cracking of the cosmic egg in the sense that uh, he's wondering if there could be more. Now, it's when you die, you die and you go to Sheol. So God has to reward you or punish you in this world. And if you weren't properly rewarded or punished in this world, it's because you're not looking at it correctly. That's the argument of Job's friends. Yes, Job, you didn't deserve all this. Your family didn't deserve this. Your kids shouldn't be dead, according to you. But if you really examine yourself, there's a reason. Who are you to find fault with the Almighty, right? So in the course of many chapters, Job does reflect pretty much the standard view that he's working within. But man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his, la his last, and where is he? You can wonder, but basically what happens when somebody dies? As waters fail from a lake, as a river wastes away and dries up, so man dies, lies down and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be aroused out of his sleep. Now this is a lament of Job, right? It's not a triumphant celebration. He's saying even a tree has more hope than I do. Because the tree dies, but there could be a bit of a sapling that could pick up a scent of water and come back again. And we could call that resurrection of the tree, right? Like a stump be cut down, but the tree... And he says, I wish it was like that, but that's not how it is. Now, so all the dead, if you see right here, I'll move this down a little bit. All the dead go down to Sheol. There they lie and sleep together, whether good or evil, rich or poor, slave or free. It is described as a region of dark and deep, the pit, the land of forgetfulness cut off from both God and human life above. Let's take a look at this psalm. Psalm 80. It's a wonderful psalm to, uh, wonderful if you like this pessimistic view of life. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out by day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, my life draws near to Sheol. It used to be translated the grave, which is okay, but I think it, it does have a sense of a place. You know, you're going to go down there. Notice my life, my life breath. 
I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one let set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. Now the idea does finally develop that God could care even about those in Sheol, but here he's, uh, he's really uh, feeling that's not the case. So the man is very sick, he's dying, He's crying out day and night. He feels like he's almost in Sheol. Now look at this, because here's the description. You've put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You overwhelm me with all your waves. And then he goes on, is your steadfast love declared in the grave? Is your faithfulness in Abaddon, which really means destruction? Are your wonders known in the darkness, or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? So if you take those descriptive words, dark, deep dark, pit, the land of forgetfulness, and so forth, you get a description of Sheol. Now what he would like uh, God to do is raise him up. In other words, uh, save him from this near-death experience. And that's the kind of thing you get, remember, with um, uh, Jonah, when he's eaten by the great being, the fish, or whatever it is, a sea creature. He's in the bars of Sheol, and in fact, he's basically dead. But then the, sh the creature vomits him up, and he says, you know, God saved me at the last minute. So the idea of uh, almost being in Shio is like you're just, you're, it's how you feel when you have the flu. Some of you know, <laughs> if you've been very sick lately, you forget how you can feel. Now Job does raise the question. In chapter 19, the most misunderstood passage, I think, in the Hebrew Bible, because of the King James Version wanting to say, remember this, I know that my Redeemer lives and in the last day he'll stand and in my flesh I will see God, right? So there we have it. Finally we got some hope. That's not what he says. Um, first of all, he's got bad breath. <laughs> he calls to his servants. I'm not going to give you all his woes, but this is pretty bad. You say to your servant, uh, could you bring me something? The guy just walks out and ignores you. I mean, you have no authority. Uh, your breath is strange to your wife. I'm a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me. Those whom I have loved have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin. I mean, he is just so bad. Now, when you're in such a state, what do you wish for? And here he wishes, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that they, with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Notice what Job is saying is, I think my case is so good. And my case is essentially, God has to deal with me beyond the grave. I'm going to die. And my friends are all saying, you know, it's just because I won't really admit that God's just and I deserve it. But what's going to happen is going to die and my case is going to be forgotten. And so someday people say, poor old Job, you know, he, God did decide to punish him. I guess he deserved it because God is just. And everybody will agree that God is just. And we don't know what he did, but he probably did something. If nothing else, he's self-righteous. But we know God is just. Good things might happen to bad people and bad things to good people, but there's a reason for it. It's not capricious. The universe is a just place. People still try to believe that today, right? But afterlife helps a lot, I think you'd agree, because then no matter what, you can say, but yeah, you got a bad shake, but wait till eternity comes. So what is he really saying? This is so logical, um, and when you read it, in context, you understand it. He's saying, I won't be here, but I don't want my case written on a parchment. I want it on a rock with a steel pen. Because this is going to be a monument in stone so that thousands of years from now, someone's going to come and read my case, like a lawyer, and they're going to say, you know, as far as I can tell, God was wrong. And there needs to be something done about this because I'll have my case written. 
So, oh, that, and I know that my Redeemer, now there's where the translate, this is the English Standard Version. It's Goel, okay. All it means is, I know that my lawyer, my advocate, is going to come along and read the rock, and he's going to say, I'm for this guy. I'm standing up for this dead guy. He's long gone. He has no hope. But as far as I'm concerned, if there is a just God in the universe, he's got something to answer for here. Because I read the case. This guy did not deserve this treatment. He's righteous. God promises to reward the righteous, punish the wicked. He didn't do it in this case. So this guy is going to come along. After my skin is destroyed, now here's where people go crazy with the translations, which are very obscure. In my flesh I will see God, whom I will see for myself, and my eyes behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. And we don't really know how to translate that. I'm not going to confuse you with the uh, Hebrew here, but if you look at this right over here, and the word zot in ari, which is really skin. Uh, um, what, he, what he seems to be saying is that this Redeemer will come along and will be able to bring his case before God. Like you say, I, I will see God. He doesn't mean he's going to get raised from the dead. What he means is, because he doesn't think he is, he's already said that, I will be brought before God's docket. See, by this representative case. Now, if you read, everyone that works on this is pretty well agreed about this, that it's tempting to translate it, you know, the kind of Handel's Messiah way, I know that my Redeemer lives, but that's not what it means at this time. But don't despair, because there will be plenty of people later that say your Redeemer lives and he'll raise you from the dead and all that. His name is Jesus Christ. So it's not as though, uh, it's just that we don't think Job was saying that. So that is the fate of people living in Shio. Uh, this is a great story that uh, we already talked about, but I just want you to see the language again. Saul says to the medium of Endor, uh, go ahead and do this. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to kill you, even though mediums had been uh, banned. And the woman said, I see a God coming up out of the earth. What is his appearance? An old man wrapped in a robe, and Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and did obeisance. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? So it's not as though the dead are non existent in the Hebrew Bible. They basically, I think the main perspective is they don't come back and they don't have anything to do with the living. And the Hebrew Bible uh, says you should not consult them. You should not try to get hold of them, and even makes fun of people that do as consulting spirits that peep and mutter. In other words, in a seance you might hear a little stir or some little squeaky voice. And, and uh, Isaiah, for example, says, uh, I think it's better if you listen to God. You know, don't be going to the dead in behalf of the living. So basically Hebrews are told not to go. Now, we're not going to do all of the world, the future of the world, but here is a famous Ecclesiastes perspective. <clears throat> this is toward the end of the Hebrew Bible in which uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet as it should be called, uh, is despairing about, let's call it the Jobian Hebrew view of existence. It's vanity of vanities, isn't it? I mean, all is vanity. Vanity meaning a puff of smoke or basically vapor. Vapor of vapors. It's all vapor. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies another. They all have the same breath. The man has no advantage over the beast. For all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust. All turn to dust again. This is the Hebrew view. He does at one point say, because he's heard other views. The Greeks do not have this view. They do in the time of Homer, by the way. Isn't that interesting? If you go all the way back to Homer, 800 BC, identical view. Identical. The dead are in Sheol. They don't come back. Occasionally you could get up a ghost. Remember Achilles and Odysseus? You could pour a little blood, pump him up a little bit. But when he comes back, he doesn't say, oh, it's so great to be back. Uh, I'm in this wonderful place in the other world. He says, you know, I'd rather be what? a servant 
uh, in your world of light than a king down here in the world of darkness. It ain't heaven. It's, you're not necessarily tortured. Later we'll get that, but at this stage you're just, you're taken out of the game. Say you're a star athlete and all you want to do is play in the game of life. Death takes you out. You're on the bench and even worse, you actually have to leave the field. So you don't get to keep up with stuff. You don't get to play or participate. That's the real loss. But you're not being burnt with fire or anything like that. That comes much, much later. So the author does at one point say, who knows whether the spirit of man goes up and the spirit of beast goes down. So he's heard some people suggesting that maybe that's not the way it is, that maybe human spirits uh, go up. And he ends the book by saying the spirit goes back to God who gave it, but if you look at it, it just means the breath, the ruach. Okay, now let's go on down. <clears throat> when the Hebrew Bible finally then describes the future, right here, here's a good example, Isaiah 11. It's probably the most, uh, this is the new heavens and the new earth. It is uh, also in Isaiah 65. <clears throat> the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, a little child will lead them. So here's this peaceable kingdom, right? This is the view. You know, you see a river bank and people are sitting around petting lions and lambs and everybody's together and it's sort of a picture of peace. Now I want to remind you of two things. One, the dead are not coming back to be part of it in Isaiah. You say, well, okay, I can't wait to get in that peaceful kingdom, like you lived up to that time. And it's described very literally uh, in that way. You know, the nations come up to Jerusalem and they learn the way of the Lord. You say, well, what about all those dead people that died throughout the centuries that were tortured or martyred or died for God? Are they not going to get to be in the peaceful kingdom? It's just not brought up, is it? Very interesting. It's not brought up. And in fact, in the parallel passage to this, this is Isaiah 11, which is Isaiah 65, see right here, verse 17, and Isaiah 66. All it says is there'll be longevity, but there's still death. It says a child will live to be a hundred. So you get longer life, but still there'll be no one who has not fulfilled his days. So that's how they're looking at it. Long life, prosperity, peace, but there's nothing about the dead coming back. In Isaiah 26, I think, there is one passage. We should probably go take a look at it. Let's see here. This is during the Assyrian invasion of Palestine, utter devastation of the northern kingdom. And look what he says. O Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us. Boy, that's really true, isn't it? <laughs> like the Assyrians. But your name alone we remember, we bring to remembrance. They are dead, they will not live. They are shades, they will not arise. See that? Um, so that's the Hebrew view. They're gone. Their sh shade is how you define the soul in Hades. It's like a shadow. It's not the real vital person with the pumping blood. Remember, uh, Achilles had to give Odysseus a uh, blood transfusion. He had to like pour some blood on him, because blood is life, and then you're like pumped up again. Uh, to that end, you visited them with destruction and wiped out all remembrance of them, but you've increased the nation, O oh Lord. You've increased the nation. You are glorified. So here Isaiah is hoping for some future. Now look at this. We'll pick up some more here. O Lord, in distress they sought you. They poured out in a whispered prayer when your discipline was on them, like a pregnant woman who rises and cries out in pains when she is near to giving birth. But we were, because of you, O Lord, we were pregnant. We ride, but we've not given birth. We've given birth to win. So think of a woman who travails in labor, like a pregnant woman, and finally the doctor says, oh, the baby's coming out right now. And then he says, there was nothing. Actually, there is nothing in your womb, uh, just, just uh, wind, just air. 
That would be a little bit of a disappointment after all that deliverance. We've accomplished no deliverance in the earth and the inhabitants of the world have not fallen. Now notice the, how this is translated. Your dead will live. Now he's already said those other people won't live. Your dead will live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Now that passage, actually it doesn't really say your dead will live, but uh, it's, it's more complex. I'm not going to go into it here, but uh, you could maybe study it in different translations. Because it's singular, it doesn't say their bodies, it says your body as if he's talking to God or something. But anyway, this does seem to be, this is called the Isaiah Apocalypse. Most scholars date it as late, like part of the exile. It's a poetry section, Isaiah 24 through 27. And it has, also, it has uh, uh, spirits in Sheol, and it has the angels being punished. It seems to be a piece embedded in Isaiah from the later period. And this does seem to show the beginnings of the idea that uh, the wicked dead will not live, but our dead will live. So that's, this is probably the earliest passage, but I don't know how to date it. Okay, the other one, and this is the clear one, Daniel 12. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your, sh your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name was found written in the book. Now notice this. This is resurrection, the Hebrew Bible. It's not even in, in the Torah, in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, we have the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, right? In the Christian Bible, Daniel's put with the prophets because <coughs> it's nice to have a book like this in, with the early books. <coughs> in the Hebrew Bible, it's at the very end with Chronicles. And what it's saying is, this is a late developing uh, kind of thought, what we call apocalyptic redemption of Israel, and it does include one line about resurrection. But notice, it's not universal. He doesn't say, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the wicked came forth, and Sheol gave up the dead. That's Revelation 20. That's not Daniel 12. Daniel 12 is, and many of those who sleep in the dust, but notice, they're sleeping in the dust. What's the view of the Hebrew view of death? Sleeping in the dust, going to Sheol. They will awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So what we know is that during this period, which is the Maccabean period, these ideas are being debated. We know the debate best between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we have, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, we have two books in the Apocrypha. There's Wisdom of Solomon, right? In the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, you have a powerfully poetic description of the ancient Hebrew view of death. That is, if you were taking notes on this, what did James say was the Hebrew view of death? This is it. This is so beautiful and moving. And also kind of sad. Notice the first line. What is life? Short and sorrowful is our life. There is no remedy when a man comes to his end, and no one has been known to return from Hades. This is a Greek text. Because we were born by mere chance, and thereafter we will be as though we had never been, because the breath in our nostrils is smoke, and the reason is a spark kindled by the beating of our hearts. Sounds like the modern scientific view of uh, biology, doesn't it? It's also the Epicurean view, and it's the Sadducean view. When it is extinguished, the body will turn to ashes, the spirit will dissolve like empty air, our name will be forgotten in time, and no one will remember our works. Now, this is tricky. You go, Boy, that's really pessimistic. According to the wisdom of Solomon, that's what a wicked person will think. So now the Hebrew view is, wick, is what the wicked one says. Those wicked Sadducees, those Epicureans, who have no faith in God that he will raise the dead. So things have switched. And so you have been Sirach that is still holding on. It's nice in the Parkerfa. 
we've got a kind of Pharisaic Sadducean debate going. Read Jesus ben Sirach and then read Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom of Solomon is the new view. The view that, of course, there's afterlife. Look, this is what he really believes. See, the quote above is he says, that's what those wicked people are saying, those Sadducees. We who believe in God say this, the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. No torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died. See that? And their departure was thought to be an affliction, and their going from us to be their destruction, but they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. So this is stage one, immortality of the soul. And stage two is going to be resurrection. You see how it logically follows? If you ask me, well, what happened to Job? I read that stone he wrote with an iron pen, and it sure seems to me like God's got something to answer. But if I can say, hey, he didn't perish. His soul went to this wonderful place. He's with God. He is doing just fine now. That gives a measure of comfort. So that's kind of stage one, and it is chronological. Now notice, the wicked don't get this. They just stay in Sheol. They don't get to come back or anything. Stage two would be, I ask, but when we set up the new heavens and new earth, and all that peaceable kingdom is in full operation, could I please ask that Job be brought back so he can be part of it? Because I like to sit down at table in the kingdom. But I want Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob there too. I kind of miss them. I've read about them all my life. I would like to meet them. And finally, the answer comes, certainly in the Gospels, you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sitting at table in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And we have lots of texts in the New Testament that then reflect the full Pharisaic view that all the dead will come forth, not just many that, that sleep in the dust. So you can see how this develops. It really does have a kind of linear logic to it. So finally, by Revelation 20, that's the grand finale of the New Testament. The sea gave up the dead which were in them, which, by the way, probably says they're not thinking bodily resurrection. Bodily in the sense of let's find all the bones and body parts, like in Michael Jackson's Thriller. I was going to show a clip of that, but look it up on the web. When Michael Jackson died this week, I was thinking, I'm going to show some of Thriller. But basically, it just shows rotting corpses coming out of the ground. That's not the idea of resurrection. In Daniel, even, these people that come forth from the dust, they shine like the stars of heaven, don't they? That is, they have a new glorious body that Paul talks about. And he said there's a physical body and a spiritual body. And the physical body is of the earth dust. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. So this idea of a heavenly body. In Enoch, it's waiting for you in heaven. It's hanging on a clothing rack in heaven, your heavenly clothing. Really, he says that. Enoch saw it. He said, I saw this clo heavenly clothing hanging there. So your suit is waiting. You have to put off your old clothes, which is your body. Then you're going to be naked for a while. You can cover yourself, but you're naked. You don't have a body. You're in Sheol sleeping. And then when you wake up from Sheol, you get your new clothes. And then you walk around and do stuff, but you're spiritual. You can pass through walls. You can like eat huge meals and you know don't even gain weight. You can do all sorts of things because you have the heavenly body. Now, exactly how it will look, don't ask, because Paul said you're a fool. You shouldn't be asking that. God will give you the, because what people wonder is, but will, I, will my nose have that same turn that I don't like? Will I, will I have this kind of, this flaw or that flaw? Or if you think a lot of yourself, am I going to be as handsome and wonderful in the new body as I am today? Because I'd like to continue having that, um, per, you know, that, that power. And Paul says, you fool. Uh, what is planted is not what comes up. So we're going to plant you in the earth, and when you rise up, you're going to come up in a new form. But he does assure you that you'll be pretty happy with it. He says it will be a glorious body, reflecting more even than the glory of the angels. So you'll be okay. If you know the movie Cocoon, I like that movie. I highly recommend it because it does seem to show a kind of metaphor. You'd, they would peel off their old skin 
and then they would kind of take this the form and then they could like shoot around the swimming pool and <laughs> and it's sort of this enhanced being but they are bodies you know they still have shape body is a way that we affirm our mode of being soul is the way we affirm our continued existence you see the difference that is if i say your soul is in shield that just means we still got you you haven't perished like these texts say that think in other words, you still exist but you're not fully booted up activated animated doing stuff the body puts you uh what would be, you see what i'm saying it, it puts you back into the game you get to do things but with all these enhanced powers so that's in paul that's definitely in jesus in fact when sadducees criticize jesus they make fun of him they say, what if a woman married a guy and the guy died and he didn't have children? So the brother's got to marry her and he dies and he doesn't have children. And I think it's seven guys. Boy, what is she feeding them? Like poison in their pudding or what? Anyway, they all die. And they say to Jesus, so we're going to have the resurrection. So here's this woman. These seven guys are going, there's my babe. Come on. I'm so glad to see you again. And the guy goes, wait a minute. That is my babe. What are you doing? Well, all seven are going to go to bed with her or what? I mean, they're thinking, so Jesus is making fun of them, and he well, basically says, you've got your mind in the gutter. He says, in the kingdom, there is not marriage or giving in marriage. There's not the physical life as we know it now. But he says, they will be transformed and like angels. So there's bo angels are bodily, meaning they, they're entities. They have, they're not like a puff of energy. Like electricity is not a body, it's, it's a force. So an angel is not a force, a, dif a diffused force. It's an entity that you could like talk to, encounter. Hi, Gabriel, how are you doing? But it's not a physical thing. But apparently, according to these texts, these entities can move in and out of the two dimensions. So that would be fun if all this were true. I mean, you know, whatever you believe. Because you would be, like you could sail around in the heavenly world for a while and then you could come back into this realm. It would be like dimensions of time or something in space. So you could come into the temporal spatial realm and then you could poof off again. And those are the kind of stories you get in the Hebrew Bible, right? An angel appears and then says, okay, I gotta go now. And just sort of puffs away. And uh, all of those ideas begin to develop. But, so those are in the Hebrew Bible, but not for humans. So now there's a great move where humans are being told, you will be like angels, and in fact, you will be greater than angels. So Paul calls these the, the glorified sons of God in Romans 8. He says that God is creating a family. This new family is made up of Jesus. He's the firstborn kid in the family. And then there's going to be a whole bunch of other kids born. But they will not be flesh and blood. They will be spiritual. And they will be above angels. In fact, they will judge angels, he says. So this is the fully developed Pauline view. As far as I can understand, Paul, the Apostle Paul, has the most developed view that, that comes to us of all the ins and outs of how all this will work. And he handles all the questions and problems that are coming to him. Like, oh, come on, a body. What, what's that going to look like? And he answers that by saying, don't ask stupid. God will do it. So finally, why did all this come? Because I'm running out of time here. We can trace it in various places, but I think one of the best places to go is the martyrs of the Maccabees, where we have in Second uh, Maccabees 7 this horrible story of this woman with her seven kids and how the kids get their tongue cut out and they're fried in frying pans and their limbs are cut off and so forth. But notice what they say. Uh, they keep their faith, right? And what they say right here, now when this man was dead also, they tormented and mangled the fourth in like manner. So this is the fourth. And when he was ready to die, he said, it is good being put to death by men to look for hope from God to be raised up again by him. As for you, you shall have no resurrection to life. So this is a more primitive view of resurrection because these guys will say like, hey, cut off my tongue, I'll get a new one. But you're not going to even be there. 
So this is kind of st stage two where it's actually, s stage one is nothing. Stage two is life in the tomb in Shio, but it ain't bad. Yeah, I mean, at least you exist. Stage three is you're going to come back. This is stage three A. You're going to come back, but they're not going to come back. And it's seen rather physically. You know, and this is what the Sadducees made fun of with Jesus. So the guy's going to come back and he's going to have all these, uh, the woman's going to have all these husbands. That's crazy. And you can imagine, you can think of all sorts of problems. If all the humans that have ever lived on the planet came back, I believe you'd have some logistical, sociological, organizational issues to deal with, you see. So that's what the Sadducees delighted in talking about. Stage 3B would be somebody like Paul or Jesus coming along and saying, it is, we're not talking about a physical reconstitution of this world. We're talking about a transformed existence in a heavenly world that is still earth in the sense that it's a new creation, but don't think you know what it's like. And Paul likes to quote, eye has not seen, neither ear heard, neither has it entered the heart of man which what God has prepared for them that love him. So Paul is full circle. After Paul, you get the church fathers. You know, they don't offer anything close to Paul. Paul is inspiring. He's lofty. He, he really does write beautifully, and he sketches this incredible view of the kingdom and the future. All enemies will be destroyed. The last enemy will be destroyed is death. Hades will be destroyed and delivered up. Christ will be, give the kingdom back to the Father. And then he has this wonderful uh, final explanation of, you say, well, what will it finally be like? God will be all things to all. That's Paul, 1 Corinthians 15. So you say, like, so everything God is will be to all totally. Sounds like Catholic catechism. We will gaze on him and enjoy his beauty forever. It's sort of like, so that's from Paul. The church fathers, you know, they're, they're kind of mundane pedestrians after Paul. They come along and discuss little nitty-gritty problems, almost like asking, well, whose wife will she be? Or Augustine has to talk about resurrection, and uh, particularly Augustine, you know, gets into this. But he basically takes the Pauline view. Now, here's the question to ask, though. Because people who go all the way with this and become Christians and accept all of these new views um, generally consider it to be morally superior. So much so that I've heard people say, even pastors, well, if there's no afterlife and all this new stuff isn't true that developed in the Second Temple period, because of martyrdom, really. I think it comes down to martyrdom. See, the martyrs raised a new question. I mean, Job's kind of a martyr, but what about a guy who quotes the Shema as you're frying him in the pan? You can't really say, oh, God blesses the righteous. See? you got to have something after. But here's the question. I've heard, I've heard people say, if this wasn't all true, then I wouldn't even want to be good. Mm, this is very dangerous. According to Plato, if you would say that, you're, you're not good. You're not good. If you don't love the good for itself, if you wouldn't do good because it's good, even if there's annihilation at death, then you're not good. And Plato would say, maybe God has a surprise for you. You're trusting on all this afterlife, and maybe the one who knows all hearts of hearts will say, but I can see that you really only did it for a reward. So actually, guess what? You're not getting a reward. You're going to get punished like the wicked because you're basically wicked. You're only doing it because you think you have to, and if you weren't getting rewarded, you would just do evil. Um, so anyway, think about those issues. These are perennial issues. They're great issues. And I do think a case can be made theologically, I usually don't speak theology, but I will for a second here, that the Hebrew view should not be discarded or considered inferior because it says basically 
God is God and will finally do whatever God does, but it's none of your business. Your business is to decide, are you going to choose life or death? So forget all the rewards, punish. Because you don't need to know how it's all going to work out. That actually could be a bad thing, because then you'll be tempted to do it for the wrong reason. All we know is we go to that grave, and there is a creator. So how are you going to live? You make your choice. So there's, there's some wisdom, I think, in that Hebrew way also, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't speak against it theologically. I, I, I want to have that there, have the other views there, and kind of look at them all.